Hello there, fellow Battle Brothers, and welcome to your weekly dose of the Space Marine Chapters lore. It has been a while since we covered some of the angelically bloody boys, so today we're gonna cover one of them. This particular chapter is known as the Bloodbearers. However, this episode is gonna be a bit more special, as it will not deal with the aspects of the chapter directly, but the story of its founder. I'm your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The origins of the ancient and venerable Bloodbearers chapter can be traced back to the earliest days of the Imperium of Man during the Wars of Unification. This was when the ancient Ninth Legion, which would become the Blood Angels, served the Emperor directly on Terra. The inception of this Blood Angel successor chapter is intimately tied to their founder and first chapter master, one Aginor Grendel, who would go on to lead the chapter on a perpetual crusade against the followers of Chaos. In his eyes, this was done to atone for their failure to intervene on behalf of their gene sire when he confronted the arch douchebag during the final confrontation of the Horus Heresy. Despite being broken by the loss of their Primarch and their inability to change their fate, those Terran-born legionaries that followed the bellicose Captain Grendel refused to give in to despair and surrender to the darkness. Instead, they rose again to take the fight directly to the archenemy. Although they had been dealt misfortune by the fickle hands of fate, the Blood Angel's legion would endure, even after being sundered into many chapters bearing different livery and traditions the chapters of the blood were still bound by their genetic legacy as scions of Sanguinius. Aginor Grendel served in the Ninth Legion of Old, in the days before the return of the Great Angel. He was a relic of the old Revenant Legion, whose outward appearance bore the noble aspect of an angel, but within lurked a red-handed, merciless killer. Recruited on the killing fields of Terra during the Wars of Unification, it is unknown from which region Aginor actually hailed from, other than the fact that he lived among the red wastes of Terra's poisoned wilds. Living among warring tribes that perpetually battled one another, Aginor managed to survive the massacres and the slaughters, until eventually his entire tribe was slain by the Ninth Legion. Despite being weakened by years of exposure to the most horrific rad zones and poisons, he underwent the transformation into a transhuman legionary, and emerged tall and fair, features sculpted in stern elegance. Aginor quickly rose through the ranks, attaining the rank of captain, earning a reputation for ruthlessness and sheer strength of will. Broken apart by the dictates of war and the needs of the Great Crusade, some Blood Angels units found themselves in small isolated companies each one fostering its own distinct brand of red cults which had spread throughout the Legion. This of course included Akinor's company, the 139, also nicknamed the Bloodbearers. They constantly fought on the leading edge of the Great Crusade, never balking from assigned duties to bring newly discovered worlds into compliance. These were undertaken with the Legion's characteristic cold fury, that stood them apart from other bloody-handed legions such as the Twelfth or the Sixth. For those of Aginor's ilk, their hunger for blood and death was as terrifying as it was effective, but only served to drag the legion further into disrepute. As the Ninth Legion stood on the edge of a knife, it was at this time that a scout flotilla of the Great Crusade discovered an insignificant world of ruins and desert, a world called Baal. When the winged Sanguinius was reunited with his sons, he bent his knee and offered his loyalty to the Emperor, freely and without reservation. Over the next decade, the newly dubbed Blood Angels were attached to many legions and imperial expeditionary groups, seeing the fall of countless worlds and the prosecution of campaigns of every kind. Each one of these was a new trial, a subtle test selected with keen insight by the Great Angel to salve the wounds inflicted by time and fate upon his sons. And with each new battle, the Legion shook off part of the stigma of their past and took their first faltering steps upon a new path. Both Aginor and his warriors found it difficult to put aside their gore-soaked solitude, that had always been the armor of their pride, and to embrace the virtues their gene sire showed them. 
When they finally returned to Baal, the Blood Angels were met by the first generation of newly raised Baalite recruits. Warriors of both spread across the many companies of the Blood Angels, that they might strengthen each other and weaken the hold of the Ninth Legion's Terran past. Unfortunately, Aginor was regarded as a bygone relic of a time and tradition that a great angel wanted to lose. Despite a senior position as captain, he found little favor among the upper echelons of the Legion, and instead remained in the role of a commander of one company lingering at the fringes of the known galaxy. This suited Aginor just fine, as he preferred to operate as an autonomous company with as few links as possible to his fellow brethren. At the opening of the Horus Heresy, many of the other legions had been operating as large bodies under the direct command of their Primarch. But even then, many smaller contingents had been seconded to service elsewhere. As the Age of Darkness ground on, many of these mighty hosts became fragmented, and while individual Primarchs often remained in direct command of the core of their legions, even more subcommands were dispatched across the galaxy in pursuit of either traitor or loyalist goals. As the Ruin Storm cut even more regions away from the Greater Imperium, many of these detachments were turned by circumstance into independent commands in all but name. Their leaders vested with what amounted to total authority to conduct their own war in whatever manner they wanted. As the 81st Expedition Fleet, commanded by Aginor Grendel, pressed into the regions beyond, all contact with them was lost for many years. Therefore, the 81st would not even learn of the outbreak of the Horus Heresy until the event was done, and thus they were unable to intervene at a vital point in history. With the end of the Heresy, the Imperium was left a shattered thing. The Emperor was mortally wounded and left a shattered broken husk, with his dream of unity erased forever. This was the universe that Aginor and his company returned to two years after the end of the heresy. He and his warriors were shocked to their very core when they received news of what had transpired. Terra attacked by the arch douchebag and the traitor legions, and during that final confrontation their gene sire had been killed when he faced his former brother aboard his flagship. Aginor and his company were stricken with a range of emotions, grief, despair, but most prominent of all, guilt. Aginor was deeply saddened by the loss of the Great Angel, as were all other Blood Angels everywhere. But as his flotilla reached the proximity of Baal, his feeling of despair turned into incandescent rage. Silently, he despaired at his failure to be present at the Siege of Terra to aid in that final battle, to fight by his Primarch's side one last time. Upon reaching Baal, the captain and a small cadre of his officers made their way down to the surface, to see for themselves the final resting place of the slain Primarch. Aginor and his fellow brothers fell to their knees and openly wept for their lost gene sire. Eventually, the grieving subsided, and Aginor and his warriors took their leave. They held counsel aboard their flagship, the battleship Crimson Death, to decide what would be their next course of action. While debate raged among the gathered throng of warriors, word reached Aginor that the Imperium intended to launch a war of vengeance against the remaining traitor forces which were lingering in their captured domains and their allies. Despite the disorganization and chaotic state of the Imperium's militaries at the time, they still retained enough power to exact a bloody revenge upon its foe. It was in 017 M31 that the first host of the Emperor swept outwards from Terra in the vengeful pursuit of the Archdouchebag's broken horde. Composed mostly of squadrons from Baal, Aginor and his warriors took part in the campaign to cleanse the northeastern fringes of the galaxy, long a stronghold of the Legion sworn to the cause of Horus. Alongside their allies from Ultramar and other loyalist enclaves, these outriders of what later chronicles would call the Scouring were very eager to inflict on the traitors the same humiliation that they themselves had suffered. Fighting would continue for another four years, before the remaining traitor forces were either destroyed or exiled into the Eye of Terror. Many chaos corrupted star systems were cleansed. Horus's death obviously did not end all the fighting, but it had renewed the resolve of the loyalists to destroy the traitors. This was a period of monumental violence, darkness and confusion. 
With new betrayals and cries for vengeance emerging daily, a great many bloody deeds went unseen. The legions were no exception to this, with many of them striving to cover up their own misdemeanors. By 021 M31, change would sweep through both the Imperial military and the offices of the Adeptus Terra. Shorn of their former identities as the Blood Angels, the new Chapters of the Blood would have to forge their own legends of glory. Agenor and many of those who followed him throughout the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy were actually fortunate, and remained within the Blood Angels chapter, while many of his finest warriors were still selected and spread throughout several different Blood Angel successor chapters. Despite the changes to the Legion, Agenor refused to sit idly by, while there were still enemies of the Imperium to pursue and destroy. Although he would protest loudly at Gilliman's act of butchery, Powerless to stop the dissolution of his beloved legion, he refused to bow to the enforced mandates of the Codex Astartes and would largely ignore its teachings. In time, his company got the reputation of one of the most active companies in the Blood Angels, their commander literally unable to rest. Skip forward about a thousand years, as the new millennium dawned, the High Lords of Terra decreed that a new founding of chapters to be created from the lineage of Sanguinius. And thus, in 001 M32, the third founding began. It was at this time that the Bloodbearers came into being. Recognized for his long, dedicated service to the Blood Angels, Agenor was granted the honor of leading his very own Space Marine chapter. He took the title Lord Commander, and the newly instilled Chapter Master of the Bloodbearers would go on to lead his chapter on a perpetual crusade bringing the light of the Emperor to the darkest corners of the galaxy. Finally cut loose of the remaining ties to the old Ninth Legion, the Bloodbearers would forge their own path to glory in the name of the Great Angel. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Bloodbearers chapter, mostly just its founder, for today. There's actually a lot of lore written for this chapter, so if you guys enjoy this, I'll definitely return to it sometime in the near future. It's always fun to narrate stuff about the Sons of Sanguinius and their unfortunate curse. Anyway, what about you? Did you know about these fellows? Are they among your favorite homebrews? As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like, share and subscribe for future content. If you want to support the channel directly, there is also a link to my Patreon in the video description. Thanks a lot for watching and the Emperor protects.